that gable end is usually the place you're gonna start, one side to the other kind of a thing. When you don't, well, it's easy here, you, we have roll around scaffolding underneath that you can get on. A lot of times on the job site, you may or may not have that. So you're limited into the accessibility of trying to position panels while they're flying or hanging off of the crane or, or your boom truck or whatever that lifting equipment is. So as we were setting panels and you guys are walking around, um, on the back side of the panels and on this, the one that we're gonna be setting, we'll put a couple of blocks on the bottom side of the panel and that will be set so that you have the proper overhang the idea then is that as you drop the panel down in place and pull it towards the wall, the gable wall, you're, you'll automatically have the right overhang distance on that. Then it's just a matter of sliding the panel up and down to get it into the right position. Hopefully you've squared up and braced the beam itself so that like we talked about yesterday, it's not snaking all over the place. And you can use that wedge or at that V at the top of the beam as a guide as to where you're setting the panels. A lot of guys will run string lines from one end to the other and use that as a reference. As you're setting the panels, that'll be down low on top of the beam, and then you can judge the distance that you're setting things apart. From the standpoint of where or what are the critical dimensions, usually it's the eave on the bottom that everybody sees. Once you get up to the top, you're gonna foam that ridge, shingles, or whatever your roof material is gonna go over the top of that. That's gonna get covered up. So if the gaps are a little bit different up there, it's not as big a deal as having things line up down on the fascia, because it's a lot more difficult to get that squared up and straight and true when you're working 10 or 15 or 20 feet in the air kind of a thing. You're also gonna string your eave walls and brace them. So that it's a we, we, one of the very first job I ever worked on when we were setting the roof panels on the garage, we had strung the, the garage wall, but we didn't brace it. And you know, it's pretty rigid. It seemed like it was fine. We got roof panels on and we realized there was a bow in the wall. And so we ended up pulling the skid steer inside the garage. A couple of guys jumped up on the roof, pulled the screws. I pushed the panels out to the string line and they ran the screws back down. So you wanna make sure you're thinking of these things as you go, because it feels rigid, but it, this is the house. You wanna make sure it's, you, you plumbed it as you went, but now we're leaning on it and moving it around and setting panels on it and bumping into it with, this, with the skid steer. And so we wanna make sure that that's straight as well. So you're, you're gonna, just like standard construction, before you start setting trusses, you're always gonna string your, your, your walls, right? We wanna do the same with this. You'll notice that the top plate and the cap plate are in place on this front wall. They're on, in the back wall where the first panels have been set, they're in place there as well. So that cap plate sits in, it's re, or the top plate is recessed down an inch and a half. The cap plate, the rim board on the edge, extends out to the full width of the panel, six and three eighths of an inch. So now <laughs> comes the time when you're really excited to start setting the roof panels, especially like in a class like this. And one of the things I asked Chuck and his team, did you drill the holes? Well, no, it's just class. So if you climb up on the ladder and, and check, there's no holes drilled in the top plate to match where the blue electrical chases are. But that's something that you guys are gonna wanna do before you start setting your roof panels. Because once you do, you can't get back in there to, to get those chases drilled. So that's a really important part for down the road when it comes time to actually run the wire and the Romex through the wall panels wherever they're gonna go. And the question is always, you know, there's a, there's a wiring chase vertically about every four feet. Do you drill every one? You don't have to. Um, if you know what's gonna be in the, in the roof for electricity, you don't necessarily have to drill every one because you're gonna wanna go back and, and foam them all, so you're not gonna leave them open. So you decide what needs to be done, but Drilling them and foaming them is a lot easier than not drilling them and needing to. <laughs> and so, you may not be running wires up into the roof panels, but what that triangular space on top of the cap plate gives you is a spot where you can run the wire up into that triangular space, run over across the over window door, or door yeah. opening, and then back down the other side, especially if you're doing a slab on grade. 
where you have concrete down below and you don't have a subfloor or anything to get down underneath to run your wiring, you're going to want to use that triangular space on top of the wall, that void space, to get your wires from one place to the next kind of a thing. So, so the a couple other things thing, to think about The other that thing way. you'll notice that they did on these panels is they snapped lines where the screws need to be going through. So they figured out where a screw staying at the pitch of the roof. It's really easy to do when it's laying flat. There is no pitch. It's just, it's just perfectly square, right? Once you get up on the roof and you're trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to keep that square? The easiest time to do it is right here. So figure out where, how far from the edge you need to be. This is the, this is the ridge edge. Yeah, this is the ridge edge. And so figure out how far you need to be back so that it's going to come through and just catch your bottom OSB. You don't want it to come out the foam. You want it to come through the OSB. You're also not going through your connecting spline. You're going in the center of the panel. Uh, these are 12 inches on center. And so they snapped the lines, they started the screws, they're resting against the bottom OSB, and now once they get this in place, the guy with the screw gun can just zip it through. They did it on the gable end as well. They did not do it on the eave, but I always did it on the eave as well. The eave is actually the trickiest one. That's, that's the smallest margin of error is on the eave, because it's got to go through so that it doesn't come out the side of the wall, and it's not so far in that it only hits the cap plate. It's got to be exactly where you need it to be to go through the cap plate and into the top plate because that's where your hold down power is. So making sure that's right and doing an inspection afterwards, walking through, even if you checked it and checked it again, walk through and make sure that some of those screws didn't get bumped and now they're coming in at the wrong angle. You want to fix it before the, before the shingles are on. You know? So by leaving that bottom row of eave screws off like they've done on this panel, it gives, well actually, this panel is plumb cut, I think, so it, it's going to stop right where the, the two two bys are. We're showing you how we're going to have a plumb cut on the end. Give me a screw but gun if we had an, ex if the panels extended right. over, you could leave them off on this first one, and the edge that's exposed where you can see the roof panel sitting on top of the wall, you can play around with what that angle is, get it to so work, measure that in? distance, the tell the guy on the ground, and then the you snap your line, and up. that becomes your your distance that you use all the time. I've had crews argue with me about this and tell me I'm wrong, but I will guarantee this is a fact. Which one of these is more powerful? Which one of these is going to do better at driving a sip screw into a, into a ridge beam? It, it is. It's, it's, a, it's a reality. This, is, this has got more torque. So many people think, well, this is an impact driver. This is the one that you're going to want to use to drive it. This one, you will get to a point where the screw just stops and won't go in any further. This one won't stop until it breaks the screw. When you put this on, on one, down on, on low, and drive it in, it will drive until it breaks the screw. And so this is the one you're going to want to use. Um, if, if you're running into it, we've had individuals call and say, we need shorter screws. We can't get them to go in. Well, they're using the wrong tool. That's, that's the reality. Um, this one often won't drive it in. So just a little thing, and I've had guys that said, no, 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 that's what this is made for, but this works better. So just a little thing, but it'll save you some heartache if, if you're struggling with it. And you want to run the screws in so that they're basically flush with the top of the OSB, so they're dimpled a little bit. We don't need to add washers to these screws. The screws already have the, the, the flange top. And so let's set panels. Yeah. Any questions before we start? Oh, one thing about the, the washers. Some SIP manufacturers do supply the washers with the panel. This, this screw has a 5 8 diameter head on it. Um, I've heard people say that by using the washer, you're Thank able you. to get things set at a consistent depth all the time. The challenge with that is that you have two pieces. And when you're the guy up on the roof and you got your pouch full of screws, guess where the plates are? Nowhere near where you are up on the roof. So just don't bother with it. Just use the screw itself, and it works just fine. And it's, so. and it's one of the reasons having the guys on the ground put the screws in is so valuable. Having your ground crew set that for you so the guys on the on a slope roof. I mean, if you're on an 812 or 1012 roof, you don't want to be trying to find a way that you can keep, you know, 18-inch screws or 14-inch screws. We have every size known. How do you, where do you put them? You can't put them in your pouch, so you try to set them somewhere and then they roll down. And so it's really nice to have the screws started on the ground. So a couple of things to note as you watch those guys put the panel up. It took a fair amount of time. 
The first panel on every side always takes a fair amount of time. The reason for that is you're trying to get it positioned in such a way that it's square to both the outside gable wall as well as the bottom eave wall. This particular panel is set up so that we have a plum cut bottom that flushes out with the wall itself and the eave side or the gable side is flush with the gable wall. So really the wall is just extending up when the siding's done the height or the thickness of that roof panel itself. Is this something that we always do? No. But what it shows is an option that you have available from a roof panel standpoint. If you look on the back side, you'll see the panels that are set back there actually overhang both the gable side as well as the eave side. That's typically the kind of detailing that we're seeing on the roof panels. One of the things as far as setting the lifting plates, from the standpoint of setting plates on a roof panel, if you fly the panel up absolutely flat so that you're right at the Perfect. center that'll, of gravity of the panel and it's flying up flat, it makes it difficult to get that thing set into place, especially when you have very little on the bottom to attach to or you're flying off the top, um, the ridge beam or the eave wall. So by about the second or third roof panel, you've got a pretty good idea where the plate needs to go. Generally, you use two, a minimum of two on the roof panel. That way you're stabilizing it from left to right. And if you move it up the slope just the right amount, it'll fly in at the right pitch, sort of like what you saw the guys do here and then you're able to just drop it down and, and set it into place. When you get to the point where you're out in the middle of the roof, you really don't have a whole lot to work with, and that's where the ratchet straps come into play. There's one thing I'd like to add to Joe talking about that, that learning curve. The reality is, while it takes you a little bit of time to get fast at it, it doesn't take you any time to get good at it. If you're aware of the details and understand where you're putting sealant, how to put it in plum and square. There's not a learning curve on doing it better. So your customer isn't paying the price for you learning. Or if you're the customer, if you're the homeowner, you're not paying the price for your, for your builder to learn. We simply get better at it. Because they're so simple, they go together so simply, there's not a lot of complications in, in putting them together. The, the houses go together from your very first house. They go together tight. They go together square. They go together strong. All of the things that you're looking for in a SIP house, even if, even if it's a brand new crew, all of that's built into it.